In the last video, we left off after we simplified our three-dimensional epidemic model and converted it to a single ODE in dimensionless form. In this video, we're going to analyze the dynamics of this dimensionless form and determine the behavior uh, of the system. So let me copy paste the dimensionless differential equation, which represents the number of people who have died in the epidemic U as a function of the dimensionless time tau. It should make sense to you that the constant A has to be greater than or equal to one. The reason for this is that by the definition of A, A equals the total size of the population N divided by the number of people who were initially healthy, S0. S0 cannot be greater than N because if we go back to this equation above, this would mean that the number of infected people or the number of dead people is negative. And that doesn't make sense at all. Therefore, A must be greater than or equal to one. Similarly, B must be positive because the parameters we use to define B, gamma, N, beta, and S0, these parameters are all positive. The next step in our analysis is to determine the number of fixed points and their stability. How do we do that, though, for this differential equation? If we employ the conventional way of finding fixed points, which would involve setting du by d tau to zero and solving for u, we couldn't get very far because then we'd be solving this complicated nonlinear equation for uf, the fixed point of u. However, if we were to slightly modify this and move the exponential to the right, we get this equation. Now this is a bit more manageable because we can plot this linear function on the left and the exponential function on the right separately. Wherever these two functions intersect is where we would then have a fixed point because these functions would be equal at that point of intersection and therefore du by d tau will be zero. I've covered this graphical technique of finding fixed points of more complicated differential equations in a previous video as well, links in the description. Anyway, let's now plot these two functions with u on the horizontal axis. I'll start with the line a minus bu, which obviously has a vertical intercept at a that we know is greater than or equal to one, and a horizontal intercept at a over b. I'll then plot the exponential function, which hits the vertical axis at one, and then slowly approaches zero as we go down horizontally. Now keep in mind the restrictions on a and b. a must be greater than or equal to one, and b must be positive. What I've plotted here is just one scenario. In this scenario, the line intersects with the exponential at two places, one at a negative value of u and another at a positive value of u. If you look at the differential equation for u, you can see that du by d tau is positive wherever the line is higher than the exponential. As a result, u is increasing in this middle area, so it tends to go to the right. However, the exponential is higher than the line at the extremes of the plot. So the derivative here is decreasing, which is why u would tend to go to the left. This would mean that the trajectory of u tends to gravitate towards this positive fixed point and go away or diverge from this negative fixed point. Hence, this positive fixed point is stable and this negative fixed point is unstable. This first scenario, by the way, corresponds to when a is greater than 1 and b is just any positive number. You can see this for yourself if you plot the two curves. If you remember the previous video, then you know that A, by definition, is N over S0. For the remainder of this lesson, I'm going to assume that we start simulating our differential equations at the very beginning of the epidemic, when S0 is approximately equal to N. Therefore, for the rest of this video, I'll assume that A equals 1. And because of this, my R, the number of dead people, always starts at 0. The second scenario that I'm going to talk about now corresponds to a situation where A is fixed at 1 and B is less than 1 but still positive. This scenario is quite similar to my first scenario, except now instead of having a negative fixed point, I have a zero fixed point UF1 and a positive fixed point that I'll call UF2. It should be pretty easy to see that once again, UF1 is an unstable fixed point since the flows tend to diverge from it, while uf2 is a stable fixed point since the flows tend to converge towards it. What this means is that if I start with zero dead people, I'm going to stay at zero dead people because u equals zero is still a fixed point. However, if I slightly shake things up and introduce an infected person into the population at the very start of the epidemic, and if people start dying as a result of that infected person, the number of dead people will rise and eventually converge to our stable fixed point uf2, which is a positive number. Now remember, the derivative is the line minus the exponential. So the larger this gap between the line and the exponential, the larger the derivative. 
In fact, what happens is that initially the difference between the exponential and the line is large, so the derivative is going to be very high. As a result, u, the proxy for the number of dead people, will initially skyrocket. Only later when this gap becomes smaller does the derivative sufficiently decrease, and eventually the increase in u becomes slower and slower until we get to uf2, our stable fixed point. And this is one of the main principles of epidemics, which you often hear echoed nowadays by public health officials. It always gets worse before it gets better. What this means is that there's a lot of people getting infected slash dying initially, but this eventually subsides and stabilizes. Ideally, though, you want it to stabilize before everyone gets infected. Now let's consider a final third scenario where A is still 1, but B is now greater than 1. In this case, my positive fixed point is no longer there, and I have a zero fixed point and a negative fixed point instead. This time, according to these flows which tell us where u is going, according to the sign of the derivative, you can see that the zero fixed point is stable and the negative fixed point is unstable. So now when b is greater than 1, then when I start with zero dead people at the start of my epidemic, I will continue to have zero dead people. Even if I shake things up and add more infected people, the infection won't spread aggressively enough and it won't kill aggressively enough. This is in contrast to scenario two where the zero fixed point was unstable and the non-zero, the positive fixed point, was stable. So it's almost like the positive fixed point became negative and exchanged stability with the zero fixed point. Essentially, the stability between zero and the non-zero fixed point has been exchanged as we went from a B less than one to a B greater than one. And what do you call dynamic behavior that involves an exchange of stability? Well, if you see my bifurcation videos, you know that it is a transcritical bifurcation. The bifurcation point here corresponds to a b of 1 and a u of 0, since u equals 0 is the fixed point that remains constant throughout. To demonstrate this mathematically, we're going to tailor expand our differential equation around this bifurcation point. The a minus bu poses no problem for the Taylor expansion. It technically already is a Taylor expansion. So we only have to expand the exponential. When we do that, this is what we end up with. Since a is already 1, we can cancel the a and the 1. And after getting rid of the higher order term, since we're only concerned about behavior around the bifurcation point, we can then combine the remaining terms as follows. And this is pretty much the same as the normal form of the transcritical bifurcation, which demonstrates that this change in dynamics indeed represents a transcritical bifurcation. So you can consider b equals 1 to be the threshold condition for an epidemic. If b is less than 1, then we've got an epidemic. People will get infected and die at high rates. However, if b is greater than 1, then we don't have an epidemic. And what's the interpretation of this? Well, recall that b is defined as gamma n over beta s0. Since we've set a to be 1, n and s0 are equal, so b is really just gamma over beta. Now, gamma is the proportionality constant affecting the rate at which infected people die, and beta is the pro proportionality constant affecting the rate at which healthy people get infected. So if beta is small, that means Few healthy people end up getting infected, which means that hardly anyone will die, even though gamma itself may be very large. That's because if there isn't anyone infected, there isn't anyone there to die in the first place. If beta is large, however, then we get an epidemic because lots of people get infected, and hence lots of people die. So that's an, anal so that's an analysis and interpretation of our epidemic model. But what about the limitations? Well, there's many limitations to a model like this, some of which you can probably glean from looking at our original assumptions. For one, we assume a static population that doesn't change except for the deaths caused by the disease. And another limitation is that we don't include a separate variable for the exposed patients who have the disease but can't spread it to others just yet. And in addition, we don't have a variable for patients who have recovered. We also assume that the disease homogeneously affects the population. In other words, with respect to killing, the disease has no preference for the patient's age and other underlying medical conditions. And finally, we also don't account for the effect of government measures like social distancing, business closures, and preventing people from selling toilet paper at an exorbitant price. Okay, maybe the last one isn't really that relevant here. In any case, there's many other issues you can find with this model, but the takeaway for any mathematical model is that the more complex you make it, 
the less you're able to understand that model and analyze it like we did in this video. So if you go into a branch of applied math involving any modeling investigations, do keep this in mind. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan signing out.